schools and science museums and libraries, etc. There really is a need for us to get some best practices out there because there's no reason not to share those best practices. Why should people have to each time find out for themselves and frankly suffer from the consequences of not doing it right? And so we have coming up here uh, Ian Charnas who is with uh, Case Western. And he's going to be talking to us about some clever solutions for training, maintenance, inventory, safety, et cetera, that they developed at Thinkbox and is a good example of some uh, best practices that maybe we can pick up from and learn from. Ian? Hello. My, my name is Ian Charnas. Um, when I'm watching a great talk, I always like to know a little bit about the person presenting. So I thought I would share just a little bit on this screen here. I've set it up so that only the smartest people in the room can see <laughs> what's on the screen right now. Um, I'm hoping we can increase it so that at least I can see what's on the screen. Thank you. Anybody want to tell a good joke? <laughs> got any? I know we got some wisecrackers here. Come on. We got one right here. Two flies in the kitchen. Which one's the cowboy? The one on the range. The on the range. Uh, <gasps> well, it'll, okay, we got one here. There are three types of people in the world. Those who can count and those who can't. Uh, I like it. I like it. Oh, there we go. Hey, now I can see it. So as I was saying, when I am watching a really great talk, I like to know a little bit about the present. So I thought I would share just a little bit. My day job is running a makerspace at a university called Case Western Reserve University, the longest title of any university that I know of. Um, but at nights, I don a secret identity, nights and weekends. I am a maker, and I make these large-scale arts and science exhibits that tour the world. The one on your left here is a computerized waterfall with a swing set attached to it. So you see a sheet of water falling, you're, sh you're certain that you're going to hit it, and then just at the right moment, the water parts and you swing through completely dry. Mostly dry. I'm going to say mostly. <laughs> so this, this has gotten popular. We got our start thanks to Maker Faire. Dale Doherty, if you're in here, thank you. Um, and we were able to do a bunch of Maker Faires, festivals, and then something happened. The random hand of the internet, or maybe it was Dale, uh, smiled upon us. And our video started trending on YouTube, and we were getting millions of views. All of a sudden, we were doing PR stunts with Swatch and uh, Ray-Ban. And we're doing a Honda commercial that aired during the Super Bowl. And we were on NBC's Today Show, and we were just having a lot of fun. Um, right now, this is on top of an art museum in Linz, Austria. And next, it's headed to Australia and Paris, which I'm excited about. Uh, the one on the, on the right here is called the Tesla Orchestra. We designed and built the world's largest twin musical Tesla coils. Of course, these are big towers, and they shoot out sparks. And we tune the electricity so it makes music. Uh, we've done two tours of Europe, uh, a bunch of shows here in the US. I get out on the stage there in a chainmail suit and dance with the lightning and like not die, which I'm always thrilled about. Uh, we do weddings. We do bar mitzvahs, baby showers. Come see me <laughs> afterwards. Now, my day job, the reason I'm here, I run a makerspace at Case Western Reserve University called Thinkbox. Um, we have a metal shop. We have a wood shop. We have laser cutters, 3D printers. You want to do computerized embroidery? You want to do your own printed circuit boards in-house? We've got that. We're housed right now, temporarily, in a 4,500 square foot space. While we complete that juggernaut there on the right, that's a seven-story, 50,000 square foot tinkerer's paradise. We're really excited about this. It's going to be one of the world's largest university-based invention centers. And the cool thing is that it's free and it's open to the public. When you come and visit us in Cleveland, and I hope you do, you're going to get access to this facility. Um, oh, thank you. We have a little golf clap there. <laughs> we worked hard on that. So we're really proud of that. And we've been getting some recognition that the White House mentioned us. Uh, they had a National Day of Making on June 18th. They had a press release, and they mentioned Case Western Reserve University alongside MIT and Carnegie Mellon. Those are great universities. I'd love to be recognized with them, right? So we're really excited about that. Um, and we've gotten that attention because we made it open to the public, but also because it's open to all our students, to the public. We're getting over 3,000 visits every month. By the end of the year, the trend is we're going to have 4,000 visits every month. And folks come in, they see our people counter on the door, they see our sign-in, they say, how are you managing that many visits a month? You have two full-time staff members. 
and a team of student workers. How are you doing it? We want to know the secret. And so we're going to share it with you. But first, we need to understand a little bit about the problem, about why this is hard. And it is hard to organize a makerspace. The image on the right here should be foreign to no one here. We've all done this, those little slips of paper, right, our to-do systems. They go into our purse and our pockets. They go through the laundry. A week later, we can't read them. We don't know what those three little initials meant that were so clear last week. We've all done this. Think of the other ways we use to organize ourselves. We keep things in our inbox, right, in our email inbox. You email yourself. You've got things in there that have been there for days, weeks, months, anybody years? You got the, that one from 2008, and you're like, I'm going to get to it. <laughs> I'm not archiving it. I'm not giving up on you email. It gets harder in a group because you're probably not going to give your students access to your email inbox. They're not going to go in there. You need a different system for organizing. And what happens in a group is we have long email chains. And you send out an email to your 30 teammates, and what happens? You've got a new policy you want to tell them about, a new way to unjam that uh, the drain tube on the, on the horizontal bandsaw. Half of them don't read it, right? They're, just, they're students, right? They have other things to do. And the other half, they forget it next week because you're sending out so many emails and emails and emails. It just gets lost in the chatter. Next week, when you hire someone new, they're going to have no idea what the email from last week said. And so it's just chaos and not the good kind of chaos. So how do you make your space self-serve? How do you get out of this rut? How do you get your staff out of the loop of helping these users and doing all these things so that they can be doing work that improves the lab, that moves forward, that moves the ball forward? And the answer, drum roll, is really, 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 really great trainings. Really great trainings so that when your users come in, they want to use the vinyl cutter, they want to use the laser cutter. If you have a training online that's so good that they can use it and ask no questions and finish their project without hurting themselves or the machine, then you've got to win. You've taken your staff out of the loop. Tutorials, right? That sounds easy. Let's, <laughs> let's take a look at a tutorial. Um, this was one of our first drafts of our vinyl cutter tutorial. I'm in the lab. I'm a user now. I'm not Ian the manager. I'm the Ian the user. And I'm selecting a roll of the vinyl from the rack. From the rack. I know there's a rack around here. So I'm looking. Oh, that's OK. I'll go ask somebody. Oh, it was, it was right on top of the I thought those were rolls of colored paper. I just I didn't know. It's my first time here. That's OK. Thanks for helping. All right, now I'm going to put that roll on uh, the rollers. You're looking at the machine, and can you see the rollers? Maybe you know that they're in the back of the machine. I don't, so I'm going to go ask a teaching assistant. And so you're getting the idea here, right? This, this instructions are awful. Our first attempt at this was, was doomed, uh, shall we say, but we were willing to change. We were willing to change. Um, so what happens here is that these tutorials are not at all self-serve. We have not yet made them self-serve. There is an art to training. There is an art, there's a psychology to it, to how to make things self-serve. And we've discovered five principles that make things really self-serve. That's what we'd like to share today. The first principle we found is to use a picture for every step. This is my quote. This, I want to have a quote that people quote me on. My quote is that I've often miscommunicated with words, but I have never miscommunicated with a picture. Imagine you're in the lab. This is a step from our actual Final Cutter tutorial, and we tell you to measure the width of the roll. There's an ambiguity there. Some people are going to measure the width that I think of. Some people are going to mention, measure the diameter, or maybe like the thickness. Some people with a higher level of many, mental acuity, they're going to sense that ambiguity, and what are they going to do? They're going to ask. They're going to come up and bother your staff, and it's not self-serve. Use a picture for every step. Have the picture succinctly describe the text. So there's kind of a one-to-one -one relationship in information corresponding between the picture and the text. Guiding principle number two, beware of assumed knowledge. We found that when we're using acronyms, when we're using abbreviations, we're shutting out a lot of folks who don't have that background, especially our international students, which is quite a lot of our graduate students. Be aware of assumed knowledge. If you are mentioning a specific tool, maybe you know what a burnisher is. I didn't when I started this job. This is a burnisher. Once you see the picture, it's clear. So beware of assumed knowledge. That's the number one thing that we need to fix in our tutorials as we go through and fix them is we find that we've assumed some bit of knowledge that a novice doesn't have. And if you want to make it self-serve, don't sit there and say, oh, they're stupid, right? Fix it. Make it better. Make it so everyone can interact with it. The third principle we discovered was to include decisions. Sometimes the next is just to make a decision. Given a list of materials and pros and cons, decide which one you're going to use on the laser cutter. Given a list of payment options, 
decide how you're going to pay for your vinyl before you go use all of it, right? Here's the first step from our vinyl cutter tutorial. Decide if you have enough time to make this. If it's 10 minutes before the lab closes and you've got a two-hour task, maybe now's not the right time to start it. Include decisions. Step four, and you might notice these screenshots are taken from, you can guess, Google Docs. I know they now call it Google Drive. Use Google Docs, Google Drive. Uh, we've seen a lot of folks make really great video tutorials, but how do you edit a video tutorial? How are you going to update it when you realize that bit of assumed knowledge, when you see that you need to add a picture, when you need to split up a step into multiple steps? Make that effort of uh, changing and updating things effortless. And we found that for us, Google Docs is that answer. And you need to be revising continuously. Watch your users. Watch what mistakes they make. Watch what questions they're asking you. And every time you get that, that's your cue to put it back in the tutorial and make it self-serve. We updated our vinyl cutter tutorial over 100 times over the course of a year. You've got to understand, we went from someone coming into the lab, and I had to spend 40 minutes with them. So 3,000 3, visits a month divided by, I might work 60 hours a week, but that's still like 60 seconds. I get with each person, that's not going to scale. So we were able to get, after about a year and a half, we're able to get all these tutorials to the point where folks are just able to come in and use them, where they're not uh, stymied by all those problems we mentioned earlier. Of course, our final principle, beware of limitations. Not everything is solvable with a tutorial. If you want to learn the drill press, if you want to learn our Bridgeport mill, I'm not just going to give you a stack of paper and let, there you go, go off to their Bridgeport mill. Some things are dangerous, we want to teach you in person, but think of what you can put online. What can you automate? What can you take your staff out of the loop on? Maybe for a drill press, that means a study guide with a quiz later so they can learn all the parts of the machine or what all those little drill bits mean, right? So that when they do have to come in for the class, it's only two hours. If you can take two hours out of a training class, out of a four-hour training class, and just put it online, that's uh, two hours multiplied by all the users that you're going to see, and that's all that time is time your staff to be doing things that are improving the lab. So you've made your machine self-serve. Users are coming in by the, by the gallon, and they're able to use these machines without bothering your staff. So you've taken your staff out of the loop on these things as much as possible. What's next? Next is to take yourself out of the loop on helping your staff. You're trying to be a leader. You're trying to lead forward, move and improve the lab. You want to be writing grant applications, installing new machines. You want to be making those K-12 through programs, reimagining the website, the billing, all those big picture moving forward kind of things. But what are you doing? You're getting interrupted every five minutes. Someone's holding up a bandsaw blade and asking you, is this worn yet? Someone's telling you you're out of supplies, that supply you need to order, right? Someone's asking you, it's the first day on the job, how do we sign out lockers around here? What's, what's the policy on that? How are you going to get forward if you're stuck in that kind of quagmire? So you've got to get yourself out of the loop. Um, for us, that was an operations manual. Take all those bits of assumed knowledge, all those questions, and put them in a new Google Doc called the operations manual. Every time a staff member asks you a question and it's not in there, put it in there. And eventually, you'll get to the point where maybe 90% of the questions that folks are asking are in your operations manual. So the very first day, one of your new staff members is on the job. A user comes in, says, I need to dispose of paint safely. Right? They don't need to bother you. They don't want to bother you. Your staff want to feel like they've got the full authority of this lab. They can run this place on their own. They don't want to go have to ask you, right? But if, if all the information is in an operations manual, then they have that kind of authority. They can get those answers themselves without bothering you. So that takes care of most of your lab logistics, um, except for maintenance. If you've ever read the, the back of your laser cutter tutorial, the back of your 3D printer tutorial, you might have seen those tasks we're supposed to be doing every month, right? It's the way that you keep your $250,000 3D printer from becoming a $250,000 paperweight. I encourage you to do these things. For us, um, we wanted to automate that. I don't want to be doing those things. I don't want to be showing people how to do those things. I want to be doing bigger picture things. So we've got this whiteboard. And by the way, this design and a lot of our materials are available for free online. This is um, a three foot wide whiteboard. I've trimmed it. But we've got opening tasks, closing tasks, weekly, monthly, yearly, quarterly tasks. And it's a good way to show at a glance what still needs to be done this uh, day, week, or month. Now, if you look at some of these things, let's look at the, uh, the top one from the, uh, on the opening task, Se second from the top, check soaps and paper towel rolls. Um, or the bottom one, email TA alerts. Does anyone know what email TA alerts mean? This, this alone 
is not sufficient. You need something that backs that up. So we have our maintenance manual. So here we go. It's time. I'm supposed to check the paper towel roll. It's my first day on the job. If anyone's ever tried to open a paper towel dispenser in a bathroom, it's like rocket scientists couldn't do it, right? It's really confusing. And when you finally do get it open, hopefully without breaking it, there's like 10 different rollers, right? It looks like a Terry Gilliam movie. And you just can't figure out how to do it. So what do you do? You make a tutorial. You make a tutorial with the same quality that you use to instruct your users. Use that same quality to instruct your staff. I never want to answer again in my lifetime how to change the paper towel roll because I want to be doing other things. Our staff made this for other staff. They're, they're smart. They get it. They don't want to be showing other TAs how to do it. So we've got, for every sufficiently complex task, one of these tutorials. This is how you check the pH on the bath where we clean our 3D printed parts. And if the pH is too low, what do you do, my friend? You have to change the bath. So we're trying to automate things. We're trying to get to the point where maintenance is just happening. Inventory is just happening. Questions are just getting answered. And you're sitting there at the helm of this thing, and you're able to move forward. You're able to do those bigger picture things. You're able to host those VIP tours to write those grant applications. I'm going to leave you with one final thought, and it's the real reason I'm here today. Um, and that's because we, we've developed these things at ThinkBox over at Case Western Reserve University because of that traffic. We got this huge amount of traffic, 3,000 visits a month. It's going to be 4,000 visits a month by the time that the year has ended here. And we were able to develop these things just to keep things running smoothly. You can't have any snags when the current is going that fast. So we did it to open it to the public. That was our motivation. And we're encouraging you now to take this and run with it. We're making all of our tutorials available. There's over 100. Our study guides, we have signage, we have graphic designs, we have something we call ability badges. They're available online, and we encourage you to share this with the person um, closest to you who's running a makerspace, a machine shop, a fab lab, a hacker, whatever you want to call it, a space where people tinker and make stuff, and encourage them to open it to the public. Um, when we opened ours to the public, we found that the state of Ohio came through. They thought this is going to be an economic engine for the, for the region, and they chipped in a million dollars towards our goal of that bigger building you saw. Um, the White House gave us a nod in their National Day of Making press release. So the return on investment, if you look at things that way, in opening your space to the public is incredible. Um, now, there is a bit of work in opening up your space to the public. And there is a bit of worry. What happens if something goes wrong, right? Uh, but what we found in developing ThinkBox is that, yes, there is quite a bit of work. And yes, there is quite a bit of worry. But there's also an incredible amount of return on investment. The stuff that comes back is really worthwhile. So that's the final thought I'm going to encourage you to go home with today. And if anybody saw anything they were interested in or want to talk more, I'd love to meet you, and I'll be available down in the cafeteria. Thank you.